All right, everybody say on mission. On mission. This is a series about living with purpose, living with focus, living on mission. You know, the devil, more than anything, is trying to distract Christians from living on mission, trying to pull their focus off their purpose. Recently, I was at our Victory Downtown campus that's getting ready to launch, and I was driving back from downtown. I was on Highway 75, and I'd gotten a, a little small box of pizza to bring home, and, and I was kind of eating the pizza before I got to the house. I pulled my you know, slice of pizza out. It's hot. It's fresh. I want to eat it when it's hot. So I got my slice of pizza. I'm driving down the highway. Got, you know, got a hand on the, the wheel. Don't copy me in this. This was not a good story, but I got to tell you. Uh, I got one hand on the pizza slice, one hand on the wheel, and I'm eating that pizza, and man, the sauce, the sauce tasted so good. And uh, right as I'm eating it, the sauce drips from the slice of pizza and falls on my leg. So I'm focusing on the road, but I'm also thinking, man, I gotta get that sauce for two reasons. One, it tastes good, so I wanna eat it. Two, I don't wanna create a stain on my jeans, and so I'm, I'm thinking, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna Keep the pizza slice in the hand because the pizza slice is important. I'm going to keep this hand on the wheel and I'm going to pinky grab the, you know, the sauce. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out where it is without looking down because I'm focusing on the road. That's the mission, right? But all of a sudden, I'm like, I can't find the sauce. I don't know where it is. And I'm trying to pinky grab it. So I slightly look down just for a second. Everybody say, don't look away. I look down. And as I'm getting the sauce, I start drifting in the other lane. Next thing I hear is a horn honking, and I swerve back in my lane, and I realized in that moment, I felt like this nice, gentle rebuke from the Lord. Your life is more important than the pizza, slot. <laughs> pizza sauce. Come on. Everybody say, your life is more important than the pizza sauce. We have been studying the story of a man who had to avoid the distraction of pizza sauce. And um, you might be going, I didn't know there was pizza sauce in the Bible. Well, it wasn't actually pizza sauce. It was distractors. It was people sent to pull him and his focus off of his mission. And the story is in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 4. If you got a Bible, turn with me there. Yeah, make some noise. This is a story about taking back territory. You know, the devil hates to lose three things. And we talked about this in the beginning of our series. The devil, number one, hates to lose control. When you start breaking out of control of what the enemy has held you in, when you start taking back the, the control of your thought life, you start renewing your mind, you start breaking down those destructive, toxic thoughts in your life, you start making the devil angry. Why? Because the devil wants to keep a control on your thought life. He wants to keep you in those toxic thought patterns. When you start taking back control in your house where there's been strife, where there's been a, a lot of darkness and you start bringing the light in, you start praying for your family, you make the devil mad because he hates to lose control of a family, of a marriage. You want to make the devil really mad? Secondly, you start taking back territory. The devil hates to lose territory. This is why I get excited about Victory Downtown launching. Why? Because it's territory. We're about to bring Jesus to some people that are caught in darkness that are about to experience the life-giving power of Jesus in the local church. Satan gets mad when the church rises up, when there's like hurricanes and earthquakes and the church is the first one to show up to bring light and help and hope to those that have just walked through painful circumstances where there's been earthquakes and hurricanes. The devil wants to keep a territory defeated. So when the church rises up like Nehemiah did, and the story of Nehemiah is really a story of rising up living on mission for God's glory and moving forward with a focus that wasn't distracted by the pizza sauce on the side. Nehemiah was moving forward and he was taking territory. See, Jerusalem had fallen to pieces. It was in shambles. It was in rubble. Their wall had been broken down. Their gates were burned. And Nehemiah rallied the people. And here's the third thing the devil hates to lose. If you take the territory, you take the control, the last thing that he tries to hold on to is the atmosphere. He's called the prince of the air. He wants to keep the vibes in the place. He says, fine, you took the acres, you took the land, but I'm gonna hold the volume over that land. I'm gonna hold the sound that's coming from that land. Here's an example. I had a friend in Australia who, uh, whose church was ruined by a flood that came through Brisbane, Australia. And so he had to move to a different location. So he was meeting in this downtown building and they were running multiple services. They were reaching a lot of people. And they were meeting in this downtown building that wasn't theirs, 
but the city provided it for them because of the flood. But the neighbors all around that building, they were atheists. They didn't like the fact that there was a church now that was, you know, praising Jesus. They hated that. So they came to the city and they complained. They said, these people are being too loud. Their volume is too high. When they start shouting and worshiping, we can hear it down the road. So they tried to control the atmosphere. You know what that pastor and, and his church did? They got out of the church. They started loving on the people all around them, started blessing their neighbors, and those neighbors got saved, came to church. Come on, Satan hates it when he loses the atmosphere. Now they got their own church building, a nicer building, and now they're reaching even more people in Brisbane. But here's the point. The devil tries to hold control of your life. He tries to hold territory, and he tries to hold the atmosphere. Nehemiah went after all three in the nation of Israel, and he started changing the game. We get to chapter 4, and today I want to talk to you about building and battling. Building and battling. Everybody say build and battle. In Nehemiah chapter 4, when Sanballat, and if you want to just insert pizza sauce, when pizza sauce <laughs> heard that Nehemiah was rebuilding the wall, that's all he was. He was just a distraction. You know, there's some people that are just distractions from your destiny. Certain people are connected to your history, but they're not connected to your destiny, right? They, they remember who you used to be. They want to keep you back in the, the old you. They want to hold you back, but now you're going to church. You're going on a mission trip. You're changing your life. Your marriage is getting turned around. Your family's getting on fire from God, and when you step up, someone's going to feel stepped on. When you start going after God, not everybody's going to be happy when you're succeeding. We always put ourselves as the hero in every story, right? We always think, I'm the Nehemiah. I'm the David that slayed Goliath. Rarely do we, you know, ask ourselves the question, am I Saul in the story? <laughs> am I Sanballat? Am I the pizza sauce that's hating on somebody that's succeeding? Is there jealousy inside of me? Am I trying to, uh, you know, throw some shade on somebody's success? Am I trying to stop someone from moving forward? If you'll start celebrating the people that God are blessing, God will start blessing you at a greater level instead of trying to hold people back from being all they can be. Come on, let people grow all around you. Don't be threatened by other success. God has success for you too. But Sanballat, he couldn't stand it. Pizza sauce was trying to distract Nehemiah's vision. So he ridiculed him. He mocked him. In verse two, it says, in the presence of his associates, critics always run with more critics. So all the critics are getting together. The army of Samaria, they said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Who's this Nehemiah trying to restore the wall? Would they offer sacrifices? Are they gonna try to finish this wall in a day? Are they gonna bring these stones back to life from the heap of rubble that they're in? Then Tobiah, the other critic, comes alongside him. More pizza sauce, come on. He says, what are these guys building anyways? Even a fox could climb up on their wall and make it fall to pieces. So they're trying to mock, they're trying to intimidate. Now, how many of y'all know not all criticism is bad criticism? There's some criticism that's good critique. When you look at the, the great athletes of our day, they didn't become great athletes without some good critique. Some coaches saying, you need to work on your free throws. You need to practice your moves here. You need to run faster. You need to get in the gym and work out more. There is some criticism that can help you grow. You gotta learn how to eat the meat and spit out the bones, right? You gotta learn how to take the right criticism. My parents used to say, consider the source. Is the person that's giving you critique, are they invested in your future? Do they care about you? Have they proven what they're trying to instruct you to do? Have they walked a day in the shoes that you're walking in? Are they further down the road of success than you wanna be? Then you might wanna listen to what they're saying. But then there's certain criticism that is just straight up destructive. It's trying to throw you down. It's trying to squash your dreams. It's trying to hold you back. And that's when you gotta learn how to tune out the haters and tune into the voice of the beloved, the Father of God who's calling you to go forward, to stay focused on your mission, to stay on track. Don't get distracted by the pizza sauce. With every godly vision, there is always ungodly opposition. With every vision, there's always going to be opposition. You know, there's going to be opposition. With any car that's moving forward, there's going to be some resistance. And that resistance isn't meant to stop you, although the enemy wants it to stop you. But if you felt any kind of opposition from family, from friends, from your boss, from, from just the devil. How many of you just felt like the devil's tried to attack you at times, right? And so what we got to learn is how to handle the opposition. This is a story about battling the opposition 
the godly way. Nehemiah was building and he was battling. He was building and he was battling. Every building requires a battle. Every building requires a battle. Don't get distracted. I remember talking to these guys who were in construction. Any construction people in the room today? Come on, how many of y'all know when you start a project, the battle is not so much at the beginning, it's not so much at the end, it's in the middle. It's in the middle. It's when you're trying, like Nehemiah was trying. He was working hard, but all of a sudden that, that oppression, that opposition started coming against him. I was talking to these guys that work high up on construction buildings, and they said one of the hardest things is not getting distracted by the birds that are flying all around you when you're up high in the air and you're working high up on a big tall house or on a big tall building and you're the one that's on the top. Don't get distracted by the birds, the little woodpeckers. Come on, how many of y'all got some woodpeckers in your life? Come on, some of those mocking birds. Mock, yeah, in, yeah, bird, yeah, come on. <laughs> You gotta learn how to tune out the birds and stay focused on the mission. I love how Nehemiah shows us how to respond to haters. By the way, when there's people that are hating on you in your life, it's because you're doing something better than them. I've never met a hater that's doing better than me. <laughs> and by the way, the haters in this story, they're trying to bring Nehemiah down. There's a reason why they're down here and you're up there. You are higher than your haters. You're on a higher level. They're trying to pull you down. They're trying to get Nehemiah down. He says, I'm not coming down from the wall. I'm not getting off the wall. I'm staying focused on my mission. Watch how Nehemiah responds. Two things we can learn from Nehemiah. Number one, he prays. Prayer changes things, by the way. Instead of retaliating on Twitter when you get angry at someone, why don't you turn to God in prayer? Instead of immediately sending that email out of anger and frustration, why don't you turn to prayer? Instead of Nehemiah immediately reacting to these people that were trying to oppose him and criticize him and squash him, he turned to God first. Prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. Let's say that together. Prayer will be my first response, not my last resort. So many people wait to pray until they're finally in that crisis at the bottom of the pit, and then they go, God, pull me out of here. But what if we started praying before we were thrown in the pit? What if we started praying immediately when the opposition came? This is how Nehemiah responded, and I love Nehemiah's honest prayer. He says, hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Don't even cover up their guilt. Don't forgive them of their sins. Throw them out. They have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Anybody ever prayed that kind of an honest prayer towards your enemies? Any Old Testament Christians in the house today? Just praying those, you know, Davidic Psalms, like crush them with the rocks, you know? At least you can admire Nehemiah's honesty. He's saying, God, this is, this is complete trash. Like their opposition, there's no merit to what they're saying. There's nothing noble about these people. They're completely trying to stop me from doing what you've asked me to do. But Nehemiah said, Lord, you take care of them. Justice is in your hands. I want to speak to some of you today that are facing opposition from lots of different angles, instead of you trying to fight the battle against them, first go to God and say, God, take care of it. God, take care of it. Deal with it. I think about a story from a pastor named Benson Nidahosa. He was a pastor. Anybody ever heard of Benson Nidahosa from Africa? There was a witch doctor who looked at Benson Nidahosa in front of a big crowd of people and said, you will die in the next few days. And your family and your ministry will all end. It will all crumble within the next few days. Everything you've worked for, it's all going to come to nothing. And Benson Nidahosa looked back at the witch doctor. He said, exactly what you just said will happen to you in the next three days. And it did. And the whole nation fell under the fear of God. See, there's something powerful. When you mess with God's kids, come on, he's about to go Liam Neeson on you. Good luck. Don't mess with God's children. <laughs> I love how Nehemiah prays. Everybody say prayer. prayer. 
And the second thing he does is persistence. Persistence. Look at what he says in verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall. Even in the face of the opposition, we kept on building. We rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height for the people had a mind and a heart to work. Historians of early European history discovered that as long as Rome had opposition, they flourished. It was only when the opposition stopped that Rome lost its glory. I think so many times we're afraid of opposition. We're afraid of trouble. Lord, don't let me go through a difficult season. But what if that trouble is actually meant to be transportation towards your destiny? What if that opposition, can you pass me that bow and arrow down there? And Pastor AJ, will you come up here and show this example? Give it up for Pastor AJ. What if that resistance, that opposition is actually meant to take you further than you would go if it had not happened to you. Now, just for a moment, don't give any resistance and just let the arrow go. No resistance, no reach. No opposition, no destiny. The greater the resistance, come on, not, don't aim it at my grandma, aim it over here. The greater the resistance, the greater, well, cut that on TV edit that. You only get that in the live service. The greater the... Wait, here we go. Let's get it right through there. Pull it, pull it up a little bit on the, on, the, on the rope. There we go. We're struggling. <laughs> Give it up for Pastor AJ. We practiced this, I promise. I totally ruined my point. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, right? Back to the Rome example. As long as there's opposition, the greater the resistance, the greater the release. The greater the, the opposition that's come against you. <laughs> the greater the opposition that's coming against you, the further God's going to take you. Instead of praying away the opposition, what if we said, God, use this opposition to launch me further towards my destiny? Lord, let the critics who've been talking trash to me see how far you can take me through the mighty power of God. I love how Nehemiah kept building even while people were battling against him. Don't get distracted by the pizza sauce. Don't get distracted by that pizza sauce over there. <laughs> but notice that the enemies didn't go away. Even when Nehemiah prayed for them to leave, they're still there. Look in verse seven, they're back at him again. They're back at him again. And it reminds me of what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, that even when the thorn wouldn't go away from my flesh, God spoke to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For when you are weak, I am strong. When opposition comes, the mighty power of God is at work inside you. It may not go away right when you want it, but I'm gonna give you the power to overcome it. You are more than a conqueror. You know, when we hear the word conquer, overcomer, in the Greek, it's called Nikaiowen. Everyone say Nikaiowen. Nikaiowen. This is what Paul said. This is what 1 John chapter 5 said, that we are overcomers. Nikaiowen. The Greeks, they shortened Nikaiowen down to Nike. They were the first ones to use that hyphenated term for Nikaiowen was Nike. They would call their, their gods, the great you know, legends, the Greek mythology uh, legends, Hercules, they would call them Nikes, conquerors. But Paul in the Bible and John in the Bible, not talking about me and my brother, but the guys in the Bible, they said, you're not just Nike, you're more than Nike. You're more than a conqueror. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. This kind of power is not just reserved for some you know, mythological gods. It's for the people of God. It's for the children of God. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Here's the thing I love about Nehemiah. His critics, his opposition, they never even touch him. They talk a big talk, but they never did touch him. There was no physical battle. The enemy talks a big talk. 
He tries to intimidate you with fear. He tries to intimidate you in your finances. Whatever it is you're working on, and all of us are working on something. We're all working on something. Maybe you're working on your purity. Maybe you're working on your marriage. Maybe you're working on your integrity. Maybe you're working on a dream. Maybe you're building your business. Maybe you started a ministry. Maybe you're working on something and the enemy's just trying to discourage you, trying to intimidate you, trying to defeat you. He can talk a big talk, but you're a child of God. And God says, he can't snatch you out of my hands. God's got you. Now listen to what Nehemiah does. He says, at that time, Sanballat, he grew his opposition. So the critics start growing, the conspiracy grows. He says, they found out we were closing in the gaps. We were making progress. Progress always incites opposition. They all plotted together and they came to fight against us. They came to Jerusalem to stir up trouble. They wanted to create confusion. But we prayed, everybody say prayer. Let's just pray right now. Lord, we just pray. Why don't we close our eyes? Lord, we just pray right now for every person in this room that's facing difficulty, opposition, anyone who's gotten a, a, a doctor's report that's bad, anyone who's facing uh, difficulty in their marriage, in their family, in their health, anyone here today who's been waiting for a long time for a dream to come to pass. God, we pray, Lord, for patient endurance, faith, God. We thank you that the miracle is in the house. The breakthrough is coming. I pray for everyone who's been opposed in their finances, where there's been attacks on them trying to get out of debt. If you've been had, having attacks in your finances, just lift your hand. I wanna pray for you right now. Lord, I pray for every hand raised in this room. I thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Lord, I pray for every good man, every good woman in this room that's trying to honor you with their finances. Seems like every time they give to God, the enemy tries to steal something from their finances. And I speak right now, Satan, get your hands off of God's people. You have no authority, you have no control, and God, I thank you. We declare every person in this room is blessed to be a blessing. Lord, we pray right now for our government, for our leaders. We pray for our president. We pray for our vice president. We pray for congressmen and Supreme Court. We pray, God, for mayors. And God, we pray for the senators. We speak wisdom. We bind strife. We bind hatred. We bind divisiveness. God, we declare this nation is one nation under God in Jesus' name. God, we pray for every town, every city that's been attacked by any natural uh, uh, disasters. God, we pray for hope. We pray for churches to rise up, to serve those that are hurting. And I thank you, God. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. I pray for a surge of love in the United States of America. I thank you, God. You're getting ready to build bridges that have been burned. You're getting ready to restore relationships that have been broken. Satan, you cannot take out this nation. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that, say amen. amen. Prayer changes us more than it changes the situation. But once it changes us, we walk into the situation and we're able to change it with the wisdom of God. Instead of retaliating and reacting in the flesh and getting all mad, we pray first. There's a lot of things I could say about a lot of things that are going on in the world, but what if I prayed before I started saying stuff? So that way I could say the right stuff. So that way I could know when it's time to speak and when it's not time to speak. So that way I could know what to say, what not to say. So that way I can know what to do, what not to do. Nehemiah was getting the answers from God first. He prayed, but then look at this. He said, after we prayed, we posted a guard day and night to meet their threat. Okay, so that's prayer, but then that's practical application. So if you lose your job, pray for God to give you another job, but pound the ground and go put in some applications at some businesses that are hiring. Stop expecting God to do every single thing for you. <laughs> if your marriage is on the rocks, pray for God to heal it, but buy her some flowers, write her a card, come home early from work, spend quality time with her, turn the TV off, pay attention to your spouse. If your family's having issues, then spend some time on your, don't expect God to do all the work and you do nothing. Nehemiah shows us, man, you got to have the building and you got to have the battling. You got to work in the natural and you got to pray in the supernatural. Believe God for him to do that only the things that he can do. But don't you give up on doing the things you can do. The enemy wants us to get lazy, wants the church to just expect God to fix everything. 
So we pray for God to bring healing in our nation, but we're going to practically do whatever it takes financially to help bring healing in our own communities, in our own neighborhoods. We're gonna do whatever we can to help minister to people that are hurting. We're going to do the practical things, whatever it is, Tulsa Dream Center. We're gonna be there, single parent ministry. We're gonna be there. We're gonna help people that are in need in Puerto Rico, in Mexico, in Florida, in Texas. We're gonna do the practical stuff, but we're gonna pray for God to do the supernatural stuff. James said, faith without works is dead. How can you expect God to do it all for you and you don't do anything with your faith? Real faith has action with it. You're stepping in step with God. God's moving with cars that are moving. He's moving with Christians that are moving. It's time to move with God. Now look what he says here. So Nehemiah does the praying and the persisting. He's working. Meanwhile, the people in Judah came to Nehemiah and they said, our strength, our labors, they're giving up, they're giving out, we're exhausted, we're failing, we're failing, we're failing. I love how Nehemiah takes what the enemy tries to bring as a failure and he uses it as fertilizer. He uses it as fertilizer. He says, all right, the enemy's trying to discourage us, the enemy's trying to put us down, trying to make us feel exhausted, weary. We're gonna turn this into a time to grow. We're gonna turn this into a time to unify, to fortify, and we're gonna figure out how to switch the game up. This was halftime, right? They had finished half the wall. Everybody say halftime. They're in the middle of the game. Half the wall's done, now they're tired. They're weary, they've lost their morale. They need a good halftime speech. Then they come to Nehemiah and they said, Nehemiah, it's not just that we're tired, it's that our enemies are all around us in verse 11. They're gonna to try to kill us no matter what we try to do. In verse 12, the Jews said 10 times, wherever you turn, they're gonna take you out. Whatever you try to do, they're gonna be there and they're gonna be there to destroy your work. So the people were discouraged, they were disheartened, they were intimidated, they felt just oppressed by the opposition. Have you ever just felt exhausted in the opposition? Ever felt exhausted working, trying to do the right thing? trying to be who God's called you to be, just tired. These people were tired. I can relate to that. I love my children, but sometimes they wear me out, <laughs> especially when they keep getting out of bed at midnight, 1 a.m. The next morning, I gotta wake up early to preach, and I'm doing my best to try and be a good dad, be a good husband, be a good pastor, be a good leader, I'm trying to do everything I can do. And Man, when you're doing it in the natural, you can get exhausted. You gotta learn how to tap into the supernatural but not lose focus of the natural. You don't just you know, go one way or the other, you got both. God can give you strength no matter what things look like, but you gotta change the game in the second half. They learned how to change the game. Everybody say, change the game. <laughs> Nehemiah was about to give them one of the best halftime speeches I've ever heard. Because what he was about to say was, listen, the first half, we just built. We had hammers, nails, and shovels. We had the mortar, we had the brick, we had the cement, we did what, the, but we're changing the game in the second half. The first half, we were playing checkers. We were reacting to the opponent. But in the second half, we're gonna play chess. And chess is a different game than checkers. Everybody say chess, not checkers. Chess is a little more strategic. Every position has a different function. I got my knights over here and my pawns over here. We're gonna play a little more, less reactionary and more expecting where the enemy might show up. We're gonna be a little more thoughtful and prepared and strategic with our game. Look what he says here in verse 13. He says, so I stationed the people behind the lowest points of the wall. Everybody say strategy. He said, I placed them at the exposed places. And I posted them by families, family next to family. It's a time for the family to get back together again. And he said, I gave them swords, spears, and bows. We're not gonna pull the bow and arrow out again. After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Everybody say, don't be scared. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. We might feel overwhelmed, but we are not outnumbered. We might feel opposed because opposition comes. When you have a vision, there's gonna be opposition. When you're living on mission, you're gonna have opposition. When you're focused on God's mission, you're gonna, you're gonna face some opposition. But he says, don't be, don't be scared. Don't be afraid. And listen what he says next. He says, here's why. Remember the Lord. 
man, we get our faith, not in our skills, not in our alarms and our locks on the doors. That's not what makes us feel secure. We know our faith, our security, our provision, our safety comes from who lives inside of us. Our God is with us. Our God is for us. I'm not scared of what the enemy may try to do. Did you know when I was a little kid, I didn't find this out until a few years later, someone came to my parents and threatened to kidnap me and my little brother, me, me and my older brother. And um, John and I, we, we were playing outside. This, this person made numerous crazy threats against my dad and mom. He ended up, you know, because of a lot of crazy things, he went to jail, but he got out of jail and there was just crazy stuff. But through all of that, they didn't even tell us when we were walking through that. And they didn't live with fear. They prayed, they did the practical things. They told us where not to be walking out all by ourselves down the street. Everybody say practicality and prayer. They changed the game. And what was, what was happening was the enemy was trying to scare my parents from ministry. This person was against what they were doing. This person was against what God had called my parents. When you start messing with the devil's territory, man, all hell's gonna break loose against you. There was a moment when I was on a missions trip in Haiti with my parents. We were in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And um, I was 10 years old, me and my brother John. And my dad called us up to share from stage. 8,000 people outside, dark night, stars in the sky. It was beautiful. You know, so we share, give back to my dad. He's preaching. All of a sudden, this demon-possessed person starts running towards the stage on all fours. I mean, hands and legs, it was crazy. It was something out of a movie. It was just unhuman. But I was scared. I got behind the chair. I'm like, I'm scared. <laughs> What's about to happen? My dad looked right at that demon-possessed person that's just running full speed at him and says, Stop in the name of Jesus. And that person just froze like the Thriller video. <laughs> and fell back. I'm not lying. I saw it with my own eyes. Don't tell me there's not a devil. I've seen what the devil tries to do. But don't tell me there's not a God. I've seen the power of God break the curses and darkness of the devil. Come on, we serve a greater God than that stupid pizza sauce devil that tries to distract us. The devil is a liar. He'll try to intimidate you. He'll try to scare you. He'll try to squash you. He gets mad that we're even talking about how we can beat him, how we can defeat him. He's already been defeated, man. Jesus paid the price on the cross. He already paid, he already fought. You're in a fixed fight. You're not fighting to win. You're fighting from victory, not for victory. You're fighting from victory, not for victory. So my dad said, stop in the name of Jesus. The person froze, fell down, and he said, be delivered in Jesus' name. The person got up, they were in their right mind, and they began to worship God. That's the power of God against the power of darkness. So Nehemiah heard the exhaustion, the opposition. He was facing the difficulties. But he said, guys, don't be afraid. Remember, our God is awesome. Our God is greater. And, and, and I challenge you, he said this to the men, and I want to speak to the men today. Men, make some noise. Come on. That's a war cry in this room. He said, men, fight for your families. Fight for your families. Fight for your kids. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your sons. Fight for your wives. Fight for your houses. Fight for the brethren. This is a time for men to fight together, not fight against each other. The enemy is trying to get men fighting against each other, playing in the marketplace, mad at each other, divided over silly little offenses. When we're called to be fighting together for our families, for our marriages, for the church, for our brothers and sisters out there, for our sons and our daughters, for the future sons and daughters, no matter who you are, God has called you to battle and to build. He didn't leave the women out either. He said, ladies, you got a part to play in this. Everyone, look what he says next. He says, when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot, that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall. Men, women, children, young, old, rich, poor, black, white, Republican, Democrat. We put all our differences to the side and we worked on the kingdom of God because the mission was more important than the pizza sauce. 
Don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. From that day on, half of the men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand. They did their work with one hand. They did their work with one hand and they held their sword in the other hand. They were working with one hand and they were battling with the other hand. They were building and they were battling. Can I get some help? Daniel, will you come on up here, Pastor Daniel? Give Daniel a big hand. They had a sword and a small little shovel. I'm almost done, but this is so powerful. They had a sword and they had a shovel. They said, we're not gonna stop building, but we're also not going to stop battling. We're gonna do the practical stuff but we're also going to contend in the supernatural. We're gonna pray, we're gonna worship on Sunday, but we're working Monday through Friday. We're going to pray and lift up the name of Jesus in our house, but we're going to work on our marriage and our family in the practical ways. We're gonna set the schedule right. We're gonna pray that God's gonna help us get healthy and healed, but we're gonna change the diet. We're gonna eat a little bit better. We're gonna take care of our bodies. We're gonna do some practical work with the shovel and we're gonna do some supernatural. Come on, the devil can't stand it when a Christian gets the shovel and the sword and starts working practically and supernaturally. When you start working the ministry and battling for your family, when you start working in the natural ways and contending for the supernatural power of God. Don't leave one without the other. You need both. Faith without works is dead. It was faith and it was works. It was prayer and it was persistence. Everybody say build and battle. Now look what he says next. I love this. I love this. This, this gets better and better. He says, so in one hand they had their tool in the other hand they had the weapon. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. So they were working. They were working. Can you give me a beat this morning just for a second? Just go boom, boom, clap, boom, boom, clap. We will, I'm just kidding. Wrong, wrong venue. They were working to a different sound. Keep it going. Can you march with me, Daniel? Come on, get your march on, bro. Go like this with this hand. And go like this with that hand. Yeah. They were working and they were battling. They were building and they were battling. And the critics were trying to stop them. The dogs bark, but the train keeps rolling. Choo choo. They were working. They were working and they were battling. You've got to learn how to work to a different sound. You've got to learn how to battle to the different drum beat than the critics, than the opposition. Come on, give God some praise this morning. On Monday, the enemy's going to try to come against you, discourage you, get you feeling lethargic. This is not a time to be spiritually lethargic. Get your sword out. But this is also not a time to just lean completely on and this is, this is what I'm saying. We've got to learn how to lean completely on God, but not forsake the responsibility as a believer in Christ, as a citizen of heaven, to contend naturally here on earth, doing our part. Does that make sense? So there is a full dependence upon God. It's not like 50-50. There's a full dependence upon God, but there's also a complete responsibility. I'm not going to be lazy. I'm not going to sleep in every day and expect God to do all the work for me. I'm going to work and I'm going to do my part and I'm going to change the game and I'm going to eat better, but I'm also going to pray that God's going to get me healthier, that he's going to heal my body, that he's going to take care of my finances. I'm going to get out of debt. I'm going to work hard on the practical side, but I'm going to pray continually that God's giving me strategy for those decisions. Now look what he says next. This is. I feel bad for the people who got to leave early. This is the best part. This is like the dessert. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. He says, and each builder wore a sword at his side, but the man who sounded the trumpet, where's my trumpet player at? Oliver, Oliver from Victor Christian School, eighth grade, one of the best trumpet players in the state.
He said, the trumpet was right next to me. So he said, come on with me. Blow that trumpet so that way they can hear how it sounds. Come on, that sounds good. Blow it again. Blow it out into the atmosphere. Charge! One more time, Oliver. That's anointing. He said, the work is spread out. It's all over the place. Verse 19, he said, listen, you guys are separated from each other along the wall. So whenever, verse 20, whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. And remember, our God will fight for us. Blow the trumpet over here. So Nehemiah was walking around the walls. He was watching. He was looking for Sanballat and Tobiah. He was making sure the pizza sauce wasn't going to distract the people from the work. So when, when the distractor, when the opposition came, he would say, come on over here. Blow the trumpet. Sound the alarm. And he would say, he'd say, listen. When you hear the sound of the trumpet, it's a sound to wake up. It's a sound to be aware and alert that the enemy lurks around like a roaring lion. Quick, he's coming up that side. Blow the trumpet. Now listen, he said this trumpet, it's a sound to be awake and alert. Don't get lethargic on the wall. When you hear the sound of the trumpet, it's a sign that the enemy is getting closer. But it's also a sign that the wall is getting bigger and higher. The opposition can't handle the progress. The greater the progress, the greater the opposition. The resistance will come. When you hear the sound of the trumpet, he's saying, get together. Don't forsake the assembly of the brethren. The enemy wants to divide. He wants to get you isolated. I don't want to go to church anymore. Those people are fake. That's what the enemy wants you to think. Nobody in here is fake. Everybody's real. Everybody has issues, problems, things they're working through. Nobody's trying to fake it. We all need Jesus. We all need the Holy Spirit. And we all need each other. We need each other. Brothers and sisters, no matter what you look like, no matter what your age is, no matter what color skin you have, no matter what your past looks like, no matter what you've walked through, we need each other. So Nehemiah said, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally together. But then he said this. He said, the trumpet, the trumpet is a reminder that God will fight for us. Guys, I don't know about you, but these last four weeks that I've been watching stuff on the news, and I think about this trumpet, blow that trumpet. I can't help but think about the book of Revelation that says at the last day, the twinkling of an eye, the trump, the trumpet will sound. And the dead in Christ will rise to meet him in the air. And the righteous ones still alive will gather together. Blow the trumpet in Zion. This is not a time to fall asleep on the wall. The trumpet was a sound to wake up the giants. Wake up the mighty men. Wake up the mighty women. Wake them up, trumpets. The enemy is drawing closer but our God will fight for us. I'm telling you right now, it's time to wake up. It's time to get right with God. Hear the sound of the trumpet. It is a call. It is a call to stop living with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. Jesus is coming back soon. He's coming back soon. And the trumpet was also a reminder to worship God in the midst of the battle. To remember our God. Say, our God. Our God will fight for us. Say, our God will fight for us. 
Now I want you to play a sound like Nehemiah told the trumpeter to play a sound of worship, a sound of praise, a reminder that God is fighting for us. Go ahead and play that trumpet, Oliver. felt a shift in the atmosphere. The trumpet is sounding, church. Don't be distracted by petty little offenses. Don't be distracted by the critics trying to oppose you. Don't be distracted by the enemy trying to pull you off mission. It's a time to build and a time to battle. Prepare the way of the Lord. He's coming back soon. We're not here to play church. We're not here to play games. We are here to build the kingdom of God. We are going to contend in the natural and in the supernatural. We're gonna do what we can and we're gonna believe that God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything we ask, dream, or imagine. All over this room with heads bowed, eyes closed, if you've been facing some opposition, if there's been an attack coming against your health, your energy, your focus. Maybe you've just felt tired. Maybe you've just felt weary. Maybe you're here today and you say, Paul, honestly, there's been opposition happening against my marriage, my family, my body, my health as a single. Whatever season of life you're in, if that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Come on, all over this room. Yeah, yeah, you've been feeling it. It's like the enemy's relentless. Maybe you've even whispered, can I get a break? Can I get a break? It's not a time to quit. It's not a time to cave in. The opposition is just trying to get in your head. If you can win the battle between the ears, you can win the battle out here. But you gotta change the sound you've been listening to. You've gotta change to the sound of praise. Get out of guilt, get into grace. Get out of fear, get into faith. Get out of discouragement and defeat, get into victory. Change the sound, change the game. All over this room, maybe you're here today and you say, honestly, Paul, if Jesus were to return, I don't know if I'm living right with God. I need to get things right with God in my heart, my mind, my life. I need to change today. I need the Holy Spirit to save me, to change me. If that's you, lift your hand. Today's your day to get things right with God. Today is your day to say, Jesus, save me, change me, make me into the man, the woman you've called me to be. I'm tired of playing games. I'm tired of having one foot in the church, one foot in the world, or both feet in the world. Today is your day to say, Jesus, I need you. I look to you. 
If you raise your hands for either of those, I want you to take a step of faith and start moving towards this altar as a sign to say, I am moving towards my mission. I'm not gonna let the opposition stop me. I'm not gonna let the criticism stop me. I'm not gonna let what the enemy has done against me stop me. I'm moving on mission. I'm, with, I'm gonna trust in God. Come on, Samuel. you to lift one hand up as if that's the hand of what you're going to do in the natural that's your shovel that's what God's called you to do that's your part you're going to work you're going to do your best now lift up the other hand as a sign of complete surrender that's your sword that's you praying in the spirit that's you contending in faith that's meditating on the word of God declaring the word of God that's worship that's prayer that's showing up to church showing up to connect group getting accountability choosing to completely trust that God is going to help you fight this battle come on this is a sign of complete surrender swords and shovels building and battling trusting in God you're about to get your strength back the Bible says those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they will mount up with wings like eagles they will run and not be weary they will walk and not faint God's about to give you strength energy focus vitality in Jesus name there's been an attack on the joy in your life, the peace in your house. Maybe there's been strife. Lord, I just speak peace. The power of darkness has no power over the Prince of Peace. He's giving you peace. He's giving you joy. He's giving you a mind and a heart to finish what you start, to contend for the faith. Now look how he ends chapter four, because this is how we're going to dismiss today. He says, He says, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve as guards by night and workers by day. Guards by night, workers by day. Swords and shovels, builders and battlers. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes each kept his weapon even when they went for water. In other words, it's an interesting way to end the chapter, but he said, we had our energy and our passion and our focus so in line with the mission that nothing distracted us from what we were called to do. I believe God's about to give you such a divine focus that nothing will deter you, discourage you, distract you, hold you back, hold you down. Like a husband who's ready to win back his wife, like a wife who's contending for her husband, like a mama who's praying for her prodigal son, like a single who's believing for that future spouse come on somebody God's gonna give you a focus Nehemiah said you can't get me to come down from the wall I'm so focused I won't even change my clothes I'm so focused I'm so on mission my passion is connected to my mission God's gonna give you passion he's gonna give you energy he's gonna give you strength he's gonna give you vitality he's gonna give you what it takes on Monday on Tuesday on Wednesday on Thursday on Friday a mind and a heart to work a mind and a heart to trust in God in Jesus name let's do something we did this last week but I feel like we need to do it again let's shout the name of Jesus I just feel like man there's just been an attack on some of y'all. It's been so intense that as you shout this name of Jesus, it's gonna change some things in your life. Are you ready to shout it? Here we go, one, two, three.
I declare in this place, the Spirit of the Lord dwells here. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I command depression to be broken off of minds, oppression to be broken off of hearts and minds. And I declare they have the mind of Christ. We take captive every thought that is not of you. Just pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I'm all yours. My mind is yours. My heart is yours. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I am more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I repent of sin. I receive your forgiveness. I receive salvation. Use me, God, for your glory, for your mission. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give God praise today. You are dismissed. You got the victory. Walk in victory down at this altar. Talk with somebody. Pray with somebody. Love on somebody. We love you so much. God bless you, victory.